Good morning. Again, our reading this morning is from 1 Peter chapter 1. It's 1 Peter 1. Give you a second to turn there. Thanks. 1 Peter 1 from verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as exiles scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to the obedience of Jesus Christ and the sprinkling of his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and unfading, having been kept in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though for now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honour at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you rejoice with joy inexpressible, and full of glory, receiving as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, inquiring to know what time or what kind of time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he was predicting the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you, in these things which now have been declared to you through those who proclaimed the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Well, we're setting out through a journey today, a journey through the book of First Peter. And First Peter is a very special and very important book of the Bible, And it's special because it's one of only two letters we have from the Apostle Peter. And it is uh, is important for us because for the last several decades, Christianity has gone from being a dominant cultural force in the West, uh, where most people would have called themselves Christians. Most people would have known the basic biblical stories. It's gone from that to Christianity having a minority status. Most Christians, most people don't call themselves Christians anymore. Even fewer attend church and fewer still know the story of Scripture. Right? And you'd be surprised at how many people don't know anything about Jesus. Uh, That is the kind of society into which Peter wrote this letter. A society in which Christians were that minority group. To this minority group, Peter writes to answer a very serious question. How can we be God's people, God's family, in a world that rejects Him and wants nothing to do with His Son? This was not a theoretical question, by the way, because for Peter, he he knew how tough it could be to follow Jesus because he'd done it in person for three years. He'd followed Jesus as a disciple, as a student, and he saw how much the religious establishment hated Jesus. He was with Jesus on the night Jesus was killed, or the night before Jesus was killed. And when Jesus rose from the dead and went up to be with God, Peter saw people beaten and murdered for their faith in Jesus. We're told by Roman historians, that Peter himself would come to die under persecution, that he, like Jesus, would be killed on a cross on a brutal Roman torture device 
for humiliation and execution. So Peter knew how bad it could be to be a Christian. And even so, he saw fit to write to these, uh, to write to these churches to remind them how to be a community of Christ followers in a world opposed to Christ. Now well, here he begins in chapter 1 by answering a simple question. Um, where can we find hope in a world gone wrong? Where can we find hope in a world gone wrong? Now, hope is a major theme in the Bible. And, you know, it's probably the number one psychological need of every human being. What do I mean by that? I mean that if you're stuck in a dead-end job, no hope of a promotion, no chance of, no prospect of retirement, it can be crippling and crushing. But if you work the same job, the same hours, with a chance, a hope that you'll get out, a hope that you'll find another job or that you'll that you'll get a promotion. That hope can drive you to power through. See what I'm saying? Hope is a powerful motivator. But it's not just a motivator, it's a need. Because if you live in a negative mindset, uh, if you live with grief or anxiety, uh, if you go through trials, and that's not buffeted by hope, the results can be deadly. There was a Jewish Holocaust survivor named Viktor Frankl, um, who was held in various Nazi concentration camps in the 1940s. And he has an account of the role hope played in those camps. And he tells of an awful story, one of the most deadly events that happened in the Christmas of 1944. He tells us the death rate increased in camp beyond all previous experience. This happened at Christmas. Why? Were the uh, prison guards more hostile, more aggressive? Were, was it colder? Was there stricter food rationing or stricter working conditions? No, it wasn't anything you might expect. He, the doctor, he tells us, said it was simply that the majority of the prisoners had lived in the naive hope that they would be home again by Christmas. As the time drew near, and there was no encouraging news, especially in the week between Christmas and New Year. The prisoners lost courage, and disappointment overcame them. You see, the number one cause of death Viktor Frankl recognized while he was in that prison camp. It wasn't anything physical. It wasn't a lack of food or water or shelter. It was a loss of hope. See, we need hope. And the Apostle Peter knew that, and that's why he begins his letter about being the church in a hostile world with this question. In a world gone wrong, in a world of pain and persecution, of earthquakes and tsunamis, of murder, of, of abuse, of human trafficking, of heartache, where can we find hope? See why this is important? What's Peter's answer? Why don't we search this passage and find out, starting with verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to those who reside as exiles, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who are chosen. Now, we need to make a couple of observations here, uh, because it's sometimes said that First Peter was written to a, a set of churches under particularly severe persecution. That this message of hope is, message, is a message of hope to those who have it worse. But that's not actually true. Um, we see here that it was written to a, a number of provinces, to a large sweeping area in the east of the Roman Empire. That's where these places are. They're all in the east, in Asia Minor. But by the time Peter died, history tells us, the only mass persecution that took place of Christians happened in the west of the Roman Empire, in the city of Rome. So Peter isn't writing to this large group of churches who are all under one persecution. No, they lived in different places with different cultures and they had different struggles. See? That means he's not just writing to those who have it worst off. He's writing to everyone, to all these churches, to all Christians. Everyone can benefit from the hope Peter preaches. 
And he begins talking about that hope here when he says in verse 1 that his Christian readers are exiles or that they are chosen. As some translations have it, they are elect exiles. What does that mean? Well, to be elect, as you can probably gather, means to be chosen. When you have an election, you choose your leaders. That's the language that's used of Israel in the Old Testament. Israel was God's chosen people. Here it's used not just of Israel, but of all the Christians in these churches. Christians are God's chosen people. I think we can, let, we can take that for granted at times. We are God's chosen people if we're Christians. That's a position of great honour, of great privilege. To be a Christian is to be chosen by God. And yet we see here to be a Christian is to be an exile, a stranger. The emphasis here isn't on the idea that we're rejected, that we've been uh, cast out and sent away, but that we're wandering strangers, we're away from home. The picture is of living in a foreign land with a foreign culture, of not quite fitting in. That's what it's supposed to be like to be a Christian. We are chosen by God Almighty for His culture, for His kingdom, and yet we find ourselves in human cultures, in human kingdoms, and indeed in the democracies of men. So we should be concerned if we're not different, if there's not a tension between us and the culture in which we find ourselves. And yet we have been chosen. We've been chosen by the Creator of heaven and earth. Verse 2, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to the obedience of Jesus Christ and the sprinkling of His blood. And Peter finishes with a customary greeting, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. So here the emphasis, you see, has shifted. It shifted away from people and shifted to God, to the triune God, to the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the God is one being and three persons. We are strangers in this world, says Peter. We are God's chosen wanderers according to the foreknowledge of the Father. This is an incredible point. We mustn't downplay this. We are chosen wanderers because before the, God, before the world began, God the Father knew us. Notice it, it doesn't say He just knew about us. God knows about everyone. But He knew us as a father knows his children. You say, that's not possible. That's God. That's the God who is not constrained by time, but knows the future. He knows his children. And he chooses them to wander, to live as strangers in the world in which they were born. And we live as strangers by the work of the Spirit. Because we're not different from the world just because we raised our hand in church one time and said, I'll do it, I'll follow Jesus. We're different from the world if we live differently, if we act differently, if we live lives transformed by the Spirit, if we live as God's children by the leading of the Spirit who dwells in all of us. Notice here, you know, it's very popular for people who believe in God in our culture to say that we're all God's children, all human beings are children of God. That's not what the Bible says. It says that Jesus is God's only begotten Son and that those who put their faith in Him, who have the obedience of Christ and the sprinkling of His blood, they are adopted. They are children by adoption. They become children of God. And the sprinkling of his blood, of course, refers to the cross, to the perfect Jesus being tortured and humiliated and killed in our place so that our sin, our evil, would be accounted for, would be duly punished through Jesus and so that his innocence would be gifted to us who believe. See where Peter starts? starting here in these first two uh, verses with the gospel. 
with the good news that Jesus died, that we who follow Him can become like Him through the Spirit, and that that is not a mistake. It was, it was the plan. It, our, our Heavenly Father knew all this. He knew us before the foundation of the world. That is the foundation of our Christian hope. And that's why Peter can look at chosen strangers and say with joy in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. See, the, the thing that reconciles us to God is that Jesus died in our place. But the thing that enables our Christian hope the reason we ha can have confidence in God is that God raised Jesus from the dead. And remember, this isn't theoretical for Peter. Peter was there. Peter was there in the hours before Jesus died. He was there and he saw the risen Jesus. Now, some people would say that, you know, he made it up. He didn't actually see Jesus. He wanted wealth or uh, money or respect or whatever, so he made up the resurrection. Remember how, how I said earlier that the only, the only mass persecution of Christians in the Roman Empire during the life of Peter was in the city of Rome? Well, the historical record tells us, well, not only was this writ, uh, letter written from the city of Rome, as Peter will indicate in chapter 5, he says it's, uh, that he's in Babylon, which was code for Rome at the time. But the historical record tells us that Peter died for his belief in the resurrection of Jesus in that persecution under the Emperor Nero. That's not something you do if you made it up. That's the kind of hope Peter is talking about. He's talking about a confidence he has because he saw Jesus risen from the dead. That's the confidence that he's talking about when he says that we're born into a living hope. The emphasis there actually in the Greek is not on us, it's on God. God has become our Father. God has given us a new life and, and that life is directed towards a living hope. A hope for what? Verse 4. To obtain an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and unfading, having been kept in heaven for you. So the life God has pointed us towards um, is a, a li well, the life God has given us is pointed towards a living hope. And that hope is in turn pointed towards an inheritance. And here we have another reference to Israel's covenant with God, because well, oh, these, these are actually scattered throughout this passage. Uh, there are far more than we have time to go into this morning, but just as God had chosen Israel and now chooses Christians, God had promised Israel an inheritance, a possession, that is to say, the land of Israel. And now He promises Christians a new inheritance, a new possession, saved for us not by our earthly parents, but by our Heavenly Father. You see that? And what does Peter say about this inheritance? What does he say? He says that it is better. It's better than the inheritance promised to Israel. Because the inheritance promised to Israel was property. Think about it. What happens to property? It decays. As soon as you drive a new car, it goes down in value. And property can be damaged, it can go wrong, it can be stolen or destroyed. And all the things that come from property, status, wealth, relationships, they can, they can be lost like that. God hasn't promised us a, a physical inheritance, though, a, uh, an inheritance that deteriorates. But God has promised us a heavenly inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, unfading. It can't be stolen. It can't be lost. It can't, it can't fall apart due to mismanagement. See why this living hope is so unique? Unlike any other hope, the hope God gives us is secure. 
in the resurrection of Jesus. It's easy for us to hope in what we have, to hope in money, to bring about our needs, to hope in a nice house or a satisfying relationship. But all of these are subject to change and loss, which the Israelites learned when their homeland went into poverty, when it was swept by idolatry, and ultimately when it was taken from them. Now, most of the people Peter's writing to here weren't Jews, but they were, uh, they were Roman subjects. And the Romans, yes, they had hope too. But typically speaking, they had a different kind of hope than the Hebrews. Uh, their hope for the future was generally in their family. What do I mean by that? I mean that the Romans saw the building block of their culture as the family and the future of the family was in their children. So they hoped for a legacy they could attain by raising good and flourishing Roman subjects. And if you think about it, in a society without Centrelink, what is your plan for the future? If you, if, if you can't save, what is your plan? Even if you can save but can't meet your needs with your money, your plan is to have plenty of kids so they can look after you, right? A lot of people today think in a similar way. It's, it's not, it's, it is a different situation, but they say, yes, I'll die, but I can make a difference through the kids I leave behind. That kind of hope does not work because it's no more certain than the hope for property because you might find you can't have children. If you can, and you put your hope in them, they will probably let you down. And if they don't, then they will die, and their children will die, and their children will die. The Hebrew hope for property is corruptible, and the Roman hope for family is well, that was them. That was a long time ago. Surely we've learnt by now. What does our, where does our culture place its hope? Where's the hope of a society that rejects any and all authority except, except that authority which gives me the right to be who I really am? that rejects the authority of God over my life, that rejects my responsibility to the government but upholds the government's responsibility to me, and that rejects even the authority of biology, of our own physical bodies, to determine whether we are men or women. Where's the hope of that society? Where do we put our hope? We put it in ourselves. See, we hope to find our inner selves, to look inside ourselves, find our true identities apart from confining outward influences. For us, it's not so much about family or property, although those things can help us find ourselves, but it's about ex uh, figuring out who you are on the inside and expressing that fully and completely on the outside. That's what we care about. And that's why our culture is so fixated on certain issues. So if you have a sexual impulse, you're encouraged to pursue that. Um, instead of submitting to what's seen as prudery or old-fashioned religious rules. Why is that? Because the rules stop you from finding and expressing yourself. That's the line of thinking, at least. And if you're a biological woman, but you detect an inward picture that doesn't match up with the outside reality. It's the picture you pursue and you try to make the outside conform to that. See, because finding who I am in our culture matters more than reality itself. So what? Isn't that a great quest? A quest to find the true you? Firstly, <laughs> Well, it's the, the problem is that it's a naive view of people. 
It's the idea that there's a one true you to find. But <laughs> if, there, if there's a you at five o'clock who is determined to diet, and another you at seven o'clock who has a care for nothing but chocolate cake, which one of those is the real you? If you manage to find the true you, somehow you'll be different like that. But it's more than that. It's the lie that the true you is inherently a good you, an appealing you, a you you'd really like to be. But if you make your inward self an outward reality, that reality will be pleasing and beautiful, that we're naturally good, that the problems with society, with the system, that the, the, the hope that we have is casting off the shackles of society, getting in and finding that inner goodness and living for that. That's not true. We're not naturally good. Ask any parent here today, try it. Say to a mum or dad, you work hard, you look out for your family, you feed them, you put a roof over their heads, you try to raise them with the right values. But at the end of the day, what you're actually doing is you're limiting them. You're actually confining them and not allowing them to express themselves. You're just an agent of society here to crush their spirits. They should be raising you because they actually know how to express themselves. Try that. If all you do is try to find yourself, you'll become selfish and useless. And that's the reality Paul talks about. Uh, in Romans 3 from verse 10, when he says, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. There is none who does good, not even one. If you follow our culture's road towards hope, if you really delve into the depths of your consciousness, find out who you really are, it will not be comforting. It won't be fulfilling. There is no hope in finding myself because without Jesus, I find that I am entirely selfish, prideful, broken. The Hebrew hope for property is corruptible and the Roman hope for family fades, but our Western 21st century hope for self-expression and self-discovery is worse than either. It is completely undone by our deceitful human hearts. We need a better hope than that. We, we need an inheritance that, as Peter talks about, is incorruptible and undefiled and unfading, which is kept in heaven, verse 5, for those who are protected by the power of God through faith, sorry, for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. See what's so great about this hope? What makes it different to the Hebrew hope for property and the Roman hope for the family and the modern hope for self-expression? Peter makes it clear. This is the only hope which does not depend on physical things or on human beings which let you down. It's the hope of salvation, that when Jesus returns to judge the earth, it won't be our darkness that counts because he offers, his, uh, he offers everyone his light, everyone who trusts in him so that we can be saved from the guilty verdict, from the terrible punishment we merit when we reject God in our words and in our actions and we will be saved into his light into an eternal kingdom or an eternal life in God's kingdom. Where Revelation 21 verse 3, God himself will be among his people. And he will wipe away every tear from their eye and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. That's the hope we have. And verse 6, in this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. This is one of the ways 
that Christians are supposed to be different, one of those cultural disconnects that we're supposed to have with the world around us. It's the fact that in the face of suffering, in the face of persecution, of of affliction, God's people can sing for joy. Think of Peter and Silas singing, or Paul and Silas singing in prison. Why were they able to do that? Because their hope was not in the here and now and in the physical things that they might attain, but their hope was with God, kept for them in heaven. In Acts 5, when the apostles are beaten for what they are preaching, what do they do? Verse 41, they rejoice. They rejoice that they are worthy to suffer for Christ. Why? Because they're not driven by the treacherous present, but by a bright future. And when Christian persecution did eventually sweep the Roman Empire, many decades later, we read this in the account of the death of Polycarp, who was a student of the Apostle John. Uh, where We are told, even when they who died for their faith were so torn by whips that the internal structure of their flesh was visible as far as the inner veins and arteries, they endured so patiently that even the bystanders had pity and wept. And turning their thoughts to the grace of Christ, they looked not on the tortures of this world, purchased at the cost of one hour, an exemption from eternal punishment. See, even in the midst of this terrible suffering, their hope is set on Christ. The hope of salvation carried these Christians through to the end. It wasn't that they didn't feel pain. It's that the hope that they felt that they had in Jesus was infinitely greater than the sufferings of the present. That's the unique power of genuine Christian hope. Why would God let that happen? Why would we who are chosen to... uh, Why do we who are chosen to wander in a foreign land... um, have to face this hostility. Verse 6. So that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honour at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, we don't like the idea that God would intend for us to suffer, but we have to think as Peter thought in the light of the cross. We have to realise that God doesn't just leave us to suffer. God himself suffered with us. He was tortured with us. He was humiliated with us. He was killed with us in the person of Jesus. When we realise that there was something more urgent to God than even his own suffering and death, we can begin to understand why we also suffer. Just as an athlete endures strain and hardship for the hope of a medal, so God chose that we should endure the darkness of this life, that he would endure it with us, because the joy that we hope for is so much brighter. He's saying that if we suffer, when we suffer with Christ, we have hope in a joy so much bigger than ourselves. And in our hope, we can receive a foretaste of that joy. As Peter explains from, verses, from verse 7, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Our culture says you're saved by learning to express on the outside who you are on the inside. God says you're saved when he takes you, when he makes you into something better than you could ever hope to be on your own. This plan for salvation wasn't a mistake. It wasn't plan B, which is why Peter adds this in from verse 9. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you 
made careful searches and inquiries, inquiring to know what time or what kind of time the spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he was predicting the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you in these things which have now been declared to you through those who proclaimed the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Peter likes his run along sentences, but do you see what he's saying here? He's saying that Christ's suffering and Christ's glory, they were only revealed in bits and pieces to the Old Testament prophets, to those great men of God were only given fragments of the gospel, that angels themselves have only seen half the picture. But he's saying that the tapestry of salvation, the promise of joy and the wonders of life live with God, uh, which were so hidden, they've been revealed to us. Been revealed to us in the person of Jesus through God's word, where we can clearly see the the pattern of Jesus' suffering and of Jesus' joy that followed. We can hope that through our sufferings will come the same joy. What a hope. The hope of Jesus foretold through the prophets of old. The hope through which we can endure the pains of the present if we cling to the cross and the hope for the future, that we will one day be saved even from death and brought into the never-ending presence of God at His new creation. What would our lives look like if we lived in light of that hope? What joy would we know in the midst of our pain? What risks would we be willing to take for the sake of the good news, knowing that any opposition, any hostility we face will be as the blink of an eye compared to an eternity in the arms of God. Every Christian here today must ask themselves the question, what am I living for? Where is my hope? Is my hope in the world, in the things of the world? Is it in property? Is it in family? Is it in my own self-expression, my own self-actualization? Or is my hope in Jesus? The only hope that can last. But if you're not a Christian, some people say, I don't want to believe in God. I don't want to believe that He rose Jesus from the dead. But if you don't know Jesus, ask yourself what kind of hope sounds better. The hope in property and the status that property can bring, which can be lost like that. Hope in the things I have, my money, my relationship. Or hope in my family, in children. If you put your hope in your children, they will let you down. How about hope in self-expression? Do you think it's a coincidence that as our society has encouraged us to look more and more into ourselves and spend our time thinking about ourselves and expressing ourselves, that mental health problems have skyrocketed? It doesn't work. There's only one hope that works. Only one. That hope is sure. There's only one hope that remains reasonable in times of loss. And maybe you're saying, I don't believe it's true. I don't believe in God. I don't believe that He raised Jesus from the dead. That's not the point. That's not what I'm saying. The point is that true or false, Jesus is our only hope for fulfillment, our only hope for belonging, our only hope for lasting love. You can say you don't think it's true, but are you really going to say you don't want it to be true? That's irrational. It makes no sense, intellectually, emotionally. Most importantly... Jesus is our only hope for salvation. So salvation from a terrible judgment and salvation into a life that lasts. So will you put 
your hope in Jesus. I'm going to pray and close the service. Father, thank you for your wonderful gift of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the hope that we can have, that we can be born again to this living hope, that it is not by our works, but by faith in your Son and in the cross. Father, I pray that we would all examine ourselves, that by your Spirit we would see where our hope is. If it is in property, Father, I pray that you would... (laughs) You would not need to to demonstrate to us how futile that is, but that we would turn our eyes around and hope in you, hope in your Son. If it's in family, Father, I pray that, that we would see that and that we would we would change. We could we would make a change because that that does no good to anyone. Father, family is a wonderful thing, and thank you for, thank you for our families. But help us not to burden them with all our hopes and all our dreams. Father, I pray that if we are obsessed with self-expression, that can be so difficult to see when we're in that situation, when we're part of the culture that's doing that. Father, I pray pray that you would show us that, that we would turn not inwards to ourselves, but outwards to you. Father, show us Jesus. Pray that each one of us would look to the cross and find our hope there. In Jesus' name.